Everyone, it's uh, great to see everybody, and uh, let me just say Happy New Year, given this is my first time back at church this year. Uh, it's great to see everybody again. I hope you've had a kind of good break. Uh, if you've had a break, and if you haven't had a break, I hope you get one at some point in time, because uh, sometimes we all need one, don't we, anyway? Uh, it is good to be back together. Um, I did just want to say, though, before I commence tonight, it's great having Cooper preach last week and lead this week. Uh, next week, I wonder whether you might pray for Cooper Um, Cooper is, you'll remember, many of you will remember Paul Bezekian, Paul and Steph, who were with us just a couple of years ago. Uh, They are ministering at a church in Narrenburn, uh, looking after a youth ministry over there, and they've asked Cooper to come and speak at their youth weekend next weekend. And so um, I'd be encouraging you to pray for him uh, as he speaks next weekend. Uh, And uh, I'd also appreciate your prayers too, because I'm actually speaking at another church's weekend as well. Uh, a guy I think was one of the first MTSs that we ever had here, trainees, uh, here at Wild Street many years ago, Doug Fife. Some of you may know him, most of you probably won't, uh, but he's at a church at Epping and I'll be speaking for his church's uh, weekend away next weekend as well. So we just appreciate your prayers uh, as we do that uh, in, in the next week. But let's pray for each other now as we open God's word together and reflect on what God has to say to us. Let's pray. Uh, Gracious God, you are a good and loving God. We've been reminded of that already tonight as we've reflected on the Apostles' Creed, as we've reflected on Isaiah. But, Father, help us to hear you speak to us in your word now. Uh, There may be all kinds of distractions. Father, we pray that we might see uh, the God of the universe speaking to us as the most important thing that we can do with our time in these next few minutes together. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is indeed our third week in our series uh, entitled Following Jesus uh, for January. In week one, we saw that following Jesus is costly, but worth it. Uh, The great thing about Jesus' call to follow him is that he actually doesn't have any fine print. Jesus himself is completely upfront about what he is calling us to when he calls us to follow him. Uh, Last week, Cooper showed us that following Jesus is about forgiveness, Uh, All of us need forgiveness for the way that we have treated God. But through Jesus, God offers every one of us forgiveness and welcome into his family. And then today, we're going to see how following Jesus brings clarity to life. How following Jesus brings clarity to life. And and given the fog of confusion we've been operating in over the the last two years, uh, we have a fresh appreciation of the value of clarity, I think, uh, a couple of years ago, just before Christmas, uh, I went down the, to the beach for an early morning swim at Maroubra, uh, and I know it's hard to imagine me getting up early and swimming, but I do both those things sometimes. Uh, and I bumped into uh, a, a dad who used to have a son at the same school that our guys went to, um, and we got talking, and he was lamenting uh, having to go to his, laws, his law firm's Christmas party that night. He's a bit unhappy because uh, spouses weren't invited, uh, and he wasn't looking forward to a night of what he called meaningless banter. Uh, People full of their own self-importance and fools doing stupid things with a bit of alcohol in them. He said, I'd much prefer to have a night at home with my wife and family. You know, we're busy enough as it is without taking us away from the things that really matter in life. And then he went on to say uh, that that we ought to be loving the ones we have and putting our time and attention into them. The party was taking him away from the things that mattered most to him, what he considered life to be all about. It was quite a uh, thoughtful moment of reflection that you don't always get when two middle-aged men bump into each other in their speedos on the beach, but there you go. But I imagine that when you ask the average Aussie uh, what they think life is all about, once they get past the humour, uh, most would probably consider certain relationships even if their pattern of life doesn't always reflect that. In the passage from the Bible that we're looking at today, Jesus is trying to bring clarity to people's lives. Jesus is teaching that life is all about God. Now, at the beginning of chapter 12, we didn't read right from the beginning, we picked it up from verse 13, but at the beginning, Luke tells us that many thousands of people had gathered uh, to Jesus, uh, and Jesus is there and he's teaching his disciples And it seems that these crowds of people are listening in as he teaches his disciples. Have a look at what he says from verse 4. He says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I, I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him 
who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now, Jesus is saying that if you want to have some clarity about life, then there's something you need to understand. You need to know who to fear. Don't worry about other people and what they might be able to do to you. Even if they do their worst and take your life, they can do no more. They cannot touch your soul. They have no say over your eternal life. Only God has a say after death. Only God has control over your eternal destiny. So make sure you take him seriously. Fear him. But notice especially that God's concern is for the good of his creatures. Look at verse 6. He says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Be clear about this, Jesus says, your life belongs to God and God intends good for you. God loves all his creatures. He doesn't even forget the tiny sparrow that he's made. He even knows every hair on your head. So intimately concerned is God for you. And you're of much greater value to God than the sparrows. Now, Jesus kind of sounds like he's contradicting himself here, but he's, he's not. See what he says? He says, your life is ultimately in God's hands. You belong to him and he controls your eternity. So fear him, not man. But you are of such value to God, he will never forget you. So fear not. See, Jesus is very clearly teaching that life is all about God and a right attitude towards him. Now, that thought, can I say, horrifies atheists. Uh, 20th century atheists claim to have killed God. Uh, We've rendered him non-existent, some said. Uh, Modern-day atheists would agree. Uh, The Nobel Prize winner, George Bernard Shaw, claimed that he was an atheist, but later on he went on to say that that was before he learned to think. He once said that he was an atheist who lost his faith. Even he couldn't explain away or exclude God. Another 20th century thinker and journalist, Malcolm Muggeridge, uh, made the point that if God is dead, someone or something will have to take his place, either power or pleasure. See, when we do away with God, all we have left is unbridled humanity. And that leads to confusion, not clarity, and ultimately to disaster. Now, that's what Jesus warns about in his encounter with a person in the crowd and in the parable he tells that we've just read. Uh, so let's just have a look at what happens here as Jesus is speaking. From, let's pick it up again at verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, Who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. Uh, Jesus is interrupted by a guy who wants some support over an inheritance dispute. And now this guy may have had a fair claim, uh, but Jesus could see the real problem. And so he issues a warning to the whole crowd. He says there, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. See, the real problem here is covetousness. And the problem with covetousness is that it's idolatry. So uh, to covet is, in its simplest form, is to crave something that doesn't belong to you. And see what the Apostle Paul says in in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. I think you'll see it's on the screen there. He says there, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And so the problem with covetousness is that it's idolatry. And the problem with idolatry is that it's a God replacement. Anything that we live for other than God is idolatry. Now, Muggeridge is right. When we do away with God, someone or something will have to take his place. And see, Jesus wants us to take care 
and to be on guard because replacing God with other things happens subtly and often gradually. And in this instance before us, it's work and possessions and who they exist for. And that's what this passage is about. Uh, Jesus warns here uh, that a person's life does not consist in the abundance of their possessions. That doesn't mean he's against us having possessions. Have a look at what he says. I'm going to pick it up from verse 22. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Do not worry about your life, your food, your clothing, any of your possessions. Life is more than these things, Jesus says, which means it must include those things. Jesus Christ is not anti-us owning possessions. Jesus is anti-possessions owning us. And so let's just take a moment to listen in on the parable that Jesus tells the crowd to warn them of the danger in the previous few verses here. Uh, verse 16, let me pick it up there. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. See, here's a man for whom life has gone well. Uh, he may have been a hard worker, uh, a good steward of his land, that's commendable. But this is also an occasion for clarity, an opportunity to keep things in perspective. Notice what is so easily overlooked here. It's the ground that produced the plentiful crops. Notice there in verse 16, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. It's not ultimately the farmer. In other words, the man's crop is a gift from God. And this man was already rich, we're told in verse 16. Uh, so this is an abundance that he doesn't even need, and all of it is from God. See, what's wrong with this man is not his stewardship, it's not his hard work or his skill, but his selfishness. Look at how many eyes and mys are in what he says there. See verse 17? And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build large ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. It would be hard to get any more self-centered than this. He even looks forward to time when he can talk to himself. See verse 19, and I will say to my soul, soul. Now how would this man be thought of here in Sydney? Well, actually, this guy is the successful one. He's the one who gets the accolades here in Sydney. He's the one who has achieved the good life. Uh, he's the winner in our world's eyes. But God says, you fool. Now notice, he doesn't say, you idiot. Not, you stupid one, but fool. And that's important because this guy's clearly not an idiot. From a human perspective, he's actually quite smart. And yet, he is a fool. I mean, in the Bible, the fool is the one who lives as if God doesn't exist. It's a prominent theme in Scripture. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. He had shut God out, and all that he had left was self-serving greed. He prepared his life for everything, but he hadn't prepared for death. See verse 20? But God said to him, fool... This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. See, when we do away with God, we are left with what is called humanism. The belief that humanity 
is the measure of all things. It's actually the second oldest of all religions. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were told that they would become like God. If they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would become like God. And the temptation was too great for them. And yet the dysfunctionality of our world shows how hopeless it is for humanity to be the measure of all things. The darkness of death that began in the Garden of Eden now falls over the whole world because we decided to operate as though God doesn't exist. But all that you have is a gift from God so that you can be rich towards God. That's what we're hearing here. See, don't waste your life by getting foolishly rich. Instead, spend your life getting properly rich. Now, Jesus spells out how we're to do that over in uh, verses 31 to 34. Verse 31, instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, verses 22 through to 30 are about our anxiety about our possessions. But God wants us actually, actually to be freed from our anxiety so that we can give our possessions away, so that we can hold loosely to them. Life is more than these things. I mean, the real treasure we should seek is the kingdom of God. And it's God's good pleasure, we read here, to give that to you. I ran into an old mate a little while back. He's a Christian guy, a successful guy in the eyes of the world. So he's a highly paid, uh, highly skilled professional. And he's married with a family and, and uh, he's quite active in his local church and he said to me, I'm looking for more ways to get involved at church this year. And my ears kind of pricked up. I confessed my interest in those kind of stories. And I asked him, why? Why was that the case? And he said to me, well, I was a little less active last year. And I found that I started putting my time into all these little projects around the home. And I decided I just don't want to become that person that wastes my life on meaningless pursuits. See, here is the clarity that Jesus brings. The clarity that Jesus brings is that you were made for God. And that gives clarity to the purpose of your life. Now, one of the great leaders in church history was Jonathan Edwards. Uh, and in one of his books, he asked the question, what is the end for which God created the world? And the answer that he demonstrated from the Bible is that God created the world for his own glory and for the good of his creatures. And then he goes on to show that the good God intends for us is his glory. The end for me is to see and enjoy the glory of God. Everything that you have, everything that you are, everything you do is for the glory of God. And if you don't get that, then you won't understand what Jesus is getting at in Luke chapter 12. And when you don't get that, well, not only do you waste your life, but like the rich man, one day your soul will be required of you. And you'll stand before the one who has authority to cast into hell. You see, contrary to what our world tells us, the person who dies with the most toys does not win. The most important thing is that we are in fellowship with our Creator that we are rich in our relationship with God. Now, sadly, there are many who are still, if you like, impoverished in their relationship with God, but all of us have been there. All of us have been in that space. None of us, in one sense, are any different than Adam and Eve. We botch our relationship with our Creator and the good that he has for us. We end up looking for purpose and clarity and riches in everything else but the one person who is completely for us and completely for our good. But Jesus does more than just simply tell us where clarity comes from. He's the only one who can bring clarity into our lives. Now have a look at, uh, at this brilliant passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. And Paul, the apostle again here, says this. He says to the church, he says, For you 
know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. See, Jesus is the only one qualified to fix our relationship with God. He's the only one who has been truly rich in his relationship with God. But he became poor for us. That is, he gave up the riches of heaven, the riches of his relationship with his own father, so that he could bring us in. Jesus experienced, when he came to earth, the full weight of our poverty, particularly our poverty in relationship, in regard to our relationship with God. And he did it so that we might, so that he might bring us into the great riches of a relationship with God. To follow Jesus is simply to accept him and all that he has done for you, to listen to him, to trust him, to do what he says. See, following Jesus in that way will bring great clarity to life. If you wanted to investigate that further, that's something that uh, intrigues you or you think, well, is that true, and you want to find out more, a chance to ask questions. Well, can I suggest that you ask us about um, our life course that will commence in February? We run it regularly, but the next one's going to start on the 14th of February. You can jot it on your little Connect card there if you'd like to know more. You can chat to me or Cooper or Josh. Uh, after church. We'd love to tell you more about it if you want to find out more about that. But we've seen over these last three, three weeks that following Jesus is costly, but worth it. Following Jesus is about receiving forgiveness and the freedom from guilt and shame that it brings. And following Jesus will bring the critically important clarity that your life and my life needs. And particularly as we start a new year together. What is it that we are going to give ourselves to this year? Will we understand the clarity that God gives to our lives so that we live in a way that he calls us to as followers of his? Well, that's a question for me and it's a question for you. So let's pray and ask God to help us as we think that through. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us. Help us to be those who rightly fear you and yet are those who are not afraid because your concern for us is always good. Father, as we reflect on our lives this year as we begin it, we pray, Lord God, that once more we be reminded that you are God and that life is summed up in you. And the decisions we make for our lives here and now will be, should be, uh, decided based upon that relationship that guides us day by day. So we pray, pray that you might help us as we think that through. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.